Here are six warning signs that you're not healthy. The first one is your gut is off. The second one, your skin is off. The third one, you can't sleep even though you're exhausted. The fourth one, you have crushing, consistent fatigue. The fifth one, your nails, they have an odd color and texture. And the last one, your lips crack at the corners. If you have one of those signs, your health's not doing very well. And by the way, if you don't have good health, you can forget about building muscle, burning body fat, or trying to maintain your youth. So pay attention. I like this. This was something that early in my career I would have wouldn't have paid very much attention to. I was so to focused any of them. on macro. Yeah. So everything had everything to do with my my workout, your your caloric deficit or surplus. Um, intensity and just not realizing how many clients of mine had stalled progress or none at all. And it was because they weren't healthy and they had all these types of signs like this. And I was constantly trying to manipulate the calories yeah. and mess with their workout to get them to break through these plateaus, not realizing how important it was that I got them healthy before us. And that seems obvious like saying that out loud like like duh of course mm -hmm. but i don't think a lot of people realize how much a lot of those those warning signs you just said can be off and how much it plays in in the factor of you seeing uh results or not in whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish inside the gym yeah, yeah. you know burning body fat your body has to feel like it can get rid of it's safe yeah um now calorie deficit does this but your body will fight hard to prevent you from losing body fat if it's not healthy because that's stored preserved insurance. energy. Yeah, it's preserved energy. Building muscle, forget about it. Like that's expensive tissue. It costs a lot of energy. We're already not healthy. Not to mention, uh, oftentimes many of these symptoms, and we'll get into each one of them. Many of these are related to nutrient deficiencies. Like, good luck trying to build muscle um, or get stronger when you have a nutrient uh, deficiency. And then uh, you know, our the aging process is accelerated with poor health. We know this, right? If you've mm -hmm. ever seen somebody who with in poor health, or if you've ever experienced this yourself, it's like you're 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 in a time warp. Um, or you could slow it down with excellent health. Uh, now, the reason why it's a challenge, I think what you're saying, Adam, is is a challenge, is because you know eating right, exercise, it's a part of getting healthier, mm -hmm. right? But it's not the only thing, right? It's definitely not the only thing. So the first one I said was your gut is off. There's this. There's so years ago I worked with somebody, she's a really brilliant young woman. I've talked about her before. And she was talking about gut health way before anybody else was. She was really making a big deal about it. I remember in the beginning too, I kind of made fun of her over it, but she was on point. And she, in the bathroom in my studio, she asked me if she could put a, a it was a small poster on the back of the door. So like when you're sitting on the toilet, you'd be looking at the door and it was a Bristol scale. <laughs> <laughs> Stare at poop while you're taking yeah, the poop. Yeah. And, and the Bristol scale- Which for type is me? For people who don't know, it'll list six levels, if you will, for lack of a better term of stool from extremely constipated to extreme diarrhea. Um, healthy stool is around a three or four. So if you look at a Bristol scale right now, you look it up, it tends to be, you know, something like five or six inches long, smooth, um, not hard to pass, you know, not runny or whatever. Like you want to have- uh, I need more a, descriptors. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah you want to have a three you, or four. You know what though is so great about this point and I know it's funny, we're laughing, tongue in cheek type of deal. It's like, but I can't tell you how many people are like so yeah. um, unaware, oh, yeah, unaware yeah. to this and that this is actually one of the first easiest signs to know like how off your gut is. And you just, and I get it because I remember being in my twenties and just attributing it. That is, that's normal. Like, yeah. oh, sometimes you have good ones. Sometimes yeah. you have bad sometimes ones. Sometimes I wake up and in, it happens like instead that. Instead of how I 100% look at it today, which is when that is, I in immediately go, oh, investigate what I just did the yeah. last 24 hours. To me, it's one of the early signs that I did something or ate something that doesn't agree with my body and it's leading clues to what that may be. And some of the earliest clues are those because skin, nail, hair, things, the other stuff, yeah. that takes time for that to, right. time to show. But stool is normally within hours or You're within right. 24 hours for sure of you making a choice that was probably not healthy for your that body. That causes inflammation in the gut. I mean, uh, gut inflammation is systemic inflammation. It's also, we now know there's a the communication highway between the brain and the gut. They call it the, the, the gut-brain axis. And if your gut is off, then your mental state is likely to be off. That's why there's a strong connection between 
anxiety and depression and what they call dysbiosis of the gut where the gut bacteria is off. That's the other one too, is it could be a, a it could either be just something you ate and, you're, and if you keep pushing it, then you're going to cause bigger problems. Or it could be bacterial overgrowth in your small intestine. It could be fungal overgrowth in your small intestine. It could be damaged, uh, you know, your, your stomach lining could be inflamed and mm -hmm. that might need help. But if you ignore this, then you'll start to get worse and worse health. You'll get uh, nutrient absorption issues, systemic inflammation, it turns into skin issues, could turn a lot, a lot of things. Some other signs that people tend to ignore, uh, one of them is really strong smelling flatulence, right? That, that is not normal, or should I say necessarily healthy. Now, I remember as a young, you know, as a, as a teenage boy trying to build muscle, taking all the protein powers. I thought that was just, oh, that's just what happens when you take protein powder. Yeah. In fact- So you're supposed to. You're supposed yeah. to. If that yeah. didn't happen and take enough protein- yeah. But uh, no, it, it, it's, it, it oftentimes means something's off. It shouldn't have, you shouldn't clear the room. <laughs> with yeah, your, yeah. I know some people watching this right now are elbowing their partner, by the way. Yeah, right? the know? paint should not peel. Yeah. Yeah. There's been plenty of weight room where everybody just had to step out. Yeah. You know? it's, well, I, it's again, another good point. I mean, shoot, we were, it wasn't even, I mean, it was a while now. It's been good eight, nine years, maybe longer now since we had our, our buddy Craig on here. And I remember, <laughs> oh, you can tell the story. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it's because the reason why it's, it highlights such a good point is because you're talking about it's a smart guy. He's not, he's not dumb at all. No. Like, Craig is a very well-read, smart dude. And I remember all of us being up in the suite that one night and it was like, bro, if the paint starts peeling off the wall from your farts, like that is a sign like, would, like you're pushing the protein or you're or pushing something. something too much. Yeah. Like the, yeah. And your, just your but almost oblivious to that because what happens again, yeah. like the stool, people just become accustomed to these things and think that, oh, this is just so yeah. normal. It's like, man, this is a, this is this harkens back to what you hear us talk about on the show for such a long time is that this is learning how to listen to your body. Your body has a lot of these, you know, I would think it's let, it's not very subtle. It's more, but with some, for some reason, it seems subtle to some people, uh, signals to tell you that, hey, something's off. Something's not mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And, you know, it, it doesn't mean you're going to draw a perfect connection every time, but it should at least cause this like, aha yeah. moment of, I need to investigate. Pay attention to it. You yeah. Know, you, yeah. You might have you know, some kind of intolerance. You might have something that you ate that you, uh, you know, you might have this repeated pattern that you're not paying attention to that you could avoid. Yeah. Another one that with the gut that a lot of women will ignore, especially young women is bloating. You, you hear a lot of young women talk about bloating. At least I did as clients that, that they just thought was normal. Oh yeah. I, I get bloated after I eat. Isn't, isn't that normal? No, oh, yeah, no, it's not. There's, there's a difference between eating and feeling full and eating and feeling yeah. bloated. Now your pants are too tight. Yeah, and everything like else. that's also a sign that something isn't right. It is a sign, as, as I said earlier, uh, that you're not necessarily healthy. Yeah. Um, then we talked about skin. When your skin is off, uh, lots of acne. Remember, there's a microbiome on your skin. And healthy skin, we know this when we look at it. By the way, the reason why we consider inherently, this is, this, this is cross cultures. This has been like this for thousands of years. It's evolutionary. The reason why we consider clear skin attractive is because it is a clear sign of poor health when it's not. That's one of the reasons why across cultures, this is yeah. makes sense. It's a visible sign. That's right. So lots of acne, uh, rashes, um, you know, those types of things oftentimes points to gut issues, food intolerances, or hormone imbalances. Hormone imbalances is, is, is a big one. That's why often you'll see uh, sometimes with women skin changing with birth control, uh, or of course we know bodybuilders on anabolics and they'll see skin issues. So that's another one you want to pay attention to. Um, that might mean something deeper. Yeah. Um, the next one is the sleeping, not being able to sleep when you're exhausted. Like that's a pretty clear sign. Like you're so tired, so exhausted. You're like, Oh my God, I can't wait to go to bed. Then you lay down yeah. and you can't go to sleep. No. What is going on? Just the adrenaline, everything else is still keeping you up. This wired energy is is there instead. Yes. Or, or worse, uh, one that you can't or don't notice, which is this uh, chronically undersleeping and not realizing. And the body is now adapted to uh, figure it out and you think you're okay, but then you're only sleeping five, six hours yeah. a night. I mean, we've had that many times before where we have somebody who thinks they feel okay. And a lot of that, that feeling of okay is that they have become 
uh, used to or adapted to how low of sleep they're getting and don't realize the importance of the getting that seven to eight hours and they're chronically undersleeping and they think because they're probably masking it with things like caffeine and, and other things, right, that is helping them get through mm-hmm. that, but really chronically uh, undersleeping and, and not realizing how much that's hindering your results in the gym. It is, but if you're tired, if you're exhausted and you go to sleep and yeah. it's broken sleep all night or you can't sleep, First of all, that's oftentimes for people who work out a sign of overtraining. Mm -hmm. One of the first signs of overtraining is I just, I'm restless all night. That's the, that's the the right word. It feels restless. Another uh, uh, cause of this is a nutrient deficiency. Oftentimes it's magnesium. This is why magnesium is such a popular pre bed supplement. It's so such a common deficiency that when you take it, you notice you're like, whoa. I all of a sudden can chill out. My body feels like it can relax and I can get some, you know, good sleep. You know, I noticed from it too is like uh, sometimes I'll be a little more tense and like I'll have this these kind of achy muscles that wake me up in the middle of the night. But when I take magnesium, it tends to help quite a bit with that. That's, yes, yeah. 100%. Oh, interesting. Nutrient deficiency. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that's a magnesium deficiency sign. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's a 50-50 shot. Everybody listening to this has got this. I mean, it's six, over 60% of the population is deficient in magnesium. Yep. So, and I wish I understood the uh, the effects of that and w- how much I would feel that. Because I remember the very first time that I took the magnesium supplement before bed, it was like an instant difference. Like it's one of those things that if you're you'll deficient in it and you take it, you'll 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 clearly know if you're one of those fifty percent that yep. or sixty percent that are deficient. Right. And then I mentioned the the crushing consistent fatigue. Now this one people tend to not ignore. Um, they'll ignore it as long as they could deal with it with caffeine and stuff. But this one tends to send people to the doctor. This is not normal fatigue. This is like lethargic, what is wrong with me type of fatigue. Uh, Luckily, though, this is one of the signs that people tend to pay attention to because they just can't function no matter what. Uh, Then I talked about nails. That one people tend to ignore. Um, Your nails having an odd color or, uh, you know, weird texture is often a clear sign of a nutrient deficiency. A lot of people don't realize that. That you can tell that you're lacking a particular nutrient by simply looking at your fingernails. They're like more brittle. And yes. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've noticed that. You know what I was going to say about the other one too, the constant fatigue? Like you can see it in people's face too, yeah. especially under the eyes. And, you know, if they're at all, like you got kind of like this like raccoon mm-hmm. eye or bags, you know, under your eyes. And uh, there's just like those visible signs you can still see of fatigue besides the fact yes. that you're just, the, you know. The nails are also connected tired. to uh, liver function. So yeah. if, you're, if your liver is stressed or uh, out of balance, can be. Um, a lot of times you'll see that in, in the fingernails also. Yeah, so. I don't know. Chinese medicine noticed that for a long time ago. They'll look at that kind of stuff. But yeah. it's backed by Western uh, science as well. Yeah. And then the, the last one I said was your lips cracking at the corners. If this and this is a relative, it's not super common, but right now I'm saying that everybody listening right now I know, can, can point out a person. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, yeah, like I, I know someone that that happens to. That oftentimes means that they have a vitamin B12 deficiency or another nutrient, but it's typically B12. Now, now, when, when, now there's, this gets a little complicated. Either A, they need to supplement with B12, or B, they're not absorbing B12 very well, which tends to point to the fact that their gut health mm. is off. So if this is you, um, then you would get your B vitamins tested um, and see, like, do I need to supplement? And again, this is an easy fix. For, for people, by the way, with B12 absorption issues, a very simple B12 injection, which most doctors will give you, make it, you'll feel it right away. I had a client like this. They went and got a B12 injection that changed their life uh, just from one shot. Whereas I could, you know, take B12 or whatever, but notice the difference because yeah. I didn't ever had a deficiency. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now if you want it. Click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. So I want to do something a little bit different, right? We, with this uh, today's episode, we have like with our partners. We have two partners, right? That we we mentioned in the episode today. You went over six of these things that are going on uh, as signs of potentially unhealthy. Using those, like Caldera, Brain FM, are two of our partners that we work with. How are, how is that as a tool that you would use help either mitigate or help one of the, these situations? Well, Brain right? FM is easy. That's sleep. That'll help you a lot uh, with sleep. So the way Brain FM works is you listen to the sounds that are coming through the headphones, and the sounds are designed and engineered to induce uh, certain um, states of brain of your brain. 
to induce certain brain waves uh, that are associated with things like focus or sleep or meditation. So, um, and this is a very effective, it's actually a, 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 a creepy effective uh, tool. <laughs> I mean, you, you put this on and five to 10 minutes later, you're like, wow, this is putting me in a different state. I, so that would be a good sleep. I found in it, in, and I don't know if there's uh, lots of other cases of what types of people uh, that are struggling with sleep. But for me, like when I struggle with sleep, aside from like obviously supplementing with magnesium is first and foremost. But it's when my when I uh, my mind starts to wander or I get uh, fixated on something in the business and I can't get out of that loop. That's probably the most common, right? Like yeah. exhausted but anxious and stressed. Right, right. And I I find that when I put that in in, in my ears, I hear the the sound back and forth, and it mm -hmm. all of a sudden pulls me away from that loop, and then I fall into a deep sleep. See, I yeah, I I've used it before for the sleep, but what I like to do uh, as opposed to that is I'll go for a walk outside, listening to like the relax, and so I'll, oh. I'll kind of get again to the mind chatter stuff and the stress is like addressing that before I start getting into my actual sleep ritual. Oh, interesting. I've never thought about using it like so that. So it's like a step before. It's just a step before. Yeah, yeah. just only because, and, and I know that they they now are like okay with you broadcasting over like a speaker. Uh, but before that, it was like you got to have like your headphones on. I just don't like sleep well with headphones on. Mm, yeah. So that was sort of my hack before that. But uh, that was just something that I did uh, with. Yeah, because you could if they if if you were to look at a person and not see what they were doing and examine their brain their brainwave patterns, you could very reliably uh, tell what they're doing. They're thinking, you know, intently, or they're sleeping, or they're meditating, uh, or they're stressed out. And so, with what they do with these sounds that they, you know, brought, they they put through these headphones, is they figured out how to get your brain into the brainwave patterns that match what you're looking for. Mm. So your brainwave pattern may look like a stressed person, but then you listen to relax, and then through the sounds, it actually teaches and trains your brain to get into this brainwave pattern. So then suddenly you feel yeah, that's actually relaxed. I don't know mm -hmm. why I had never thought to do that, Justin. I think doing that and pairing it even too with like a gratitude practice while you're walking. So, you know, oh, like totally, dude. how you'll take yeah. you out of that anxious mindset uh, by having a gratitude practice. So yep. pairing that with the brain FM in there yep. before to prep for sleep, that's not a bad idea. You know what else is something for sleep? I, yeah, I talked it. about this on a recent, we had a caller call in who talked about how they had poor sleep and they were on a low carb diet. And uh, I recommended that they eat carbohydrates uh, before going to bed, you know, maybe, maybe two or three hours before bed. Carbohydrates before bed for many people, not right before bed. You don't want to eat anything right before bed, but you know, your, your last meal a day, carbohydrates have been shown to improve people's sleep because it contributes to tryptophan being utilized by the brain. Now, carbohydrates don't contain tryptophan, but they do take help that tryptophan get transported and utilized by the brain. And that also helps and contributes to melatonin production. So in, in many cases, having, if, especially if someone's eating low carb, having them eat their carbohydrates as their last meal will help them get better sleep. Just a new little, little tidbit. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, that's like a hack for mm -hmm. babies. You know, you do that. Like you ever mm -hmm. seen people who will put like crushed uh, cereal or something like that to add carbohydrates oh, into their milk? Oh yeah. It's like uh -huh. a... Like a hack to help oh, your wow. baby sleep at night. If you have a if you have a baby wakes up in the middle of the night, a lot of times they're waking up too because they want more calories, and more food, and so a mm -hmm. denser, heavier carbohydrate meal with like their milk tends to help the baby sleep more. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you you brought up Caldera for skincare. You know, Caldera is a topical product, uh, but the compounds in Caldera are these natural botanicals that reduce inflammation, have antioxidant properties, and promote. And this is the most important thing promote a healthy microbiome on the skin. Yeah. So that makes a huge difference. This is why, so a lot of people don't realize this, but the the classic over-the-counter acne uh, uh, treatments, uh, benzoyl peroxide uh, is one of them. Um, another one is salicylic acid, I think. Those are topical antibiotics, essentially. I was going to say, yeah, they kill the bacteria. They kill right? bacteria. Yeah. And this is why they make your acne, in many cases, go away, unless there's a much deeper root, uh, you know, root cause. Um, so what a product like Caldera does, it's a face oil and it balances out your skin's oil and all that stuff, but it also helps promote healthy, uh, microbiome, which by the way, uh, so they do studies on their own stuff, clinical studies. I didn't know this. The typical skincare product, if they do run a clinical study is 30 people for 30 days. Caldera did a study that was 50 days and it was, I think 50 people or 50 something people for 50 or 60 days. So twice as long well beyond 
what is considered industry standard. Interesting. I wonder what the That's strategy cool. is for the other companies to do shorter periods like that. Cheaper. Yeah. It's uh, much I cheaper. Imagine. Is that the main reason you yeah. think? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's much cheaper. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, you, you, I mean, why would you, you, you want to do the minimum because, you know, expensive studies are to conduct, but Caldera did it like almost twice as long with more people. I guess I never thought of that like that. The difference of 30 days to 50 days makes such a difference in price for what it would cost to get a study done. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think that yeah. that would make that big of a difference. That's the study that they showed 91% uh, of the, you know, people saw improvements in their skin reduced fine lines and wrinkles and all that stuff. That's I mean, I haven't had anybody use the product and not say that. Yeah. Every single person, family, yeah. friend that I've, I've sent in that direction have all said nothing but positive things about yep, it. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, yeah. yeah, interesting. It's pretty Any, effective. Anyway, I, I learned something the other day. It's a true story that I did not know was true, but there was a, a, a semi-funny movie. It wasn't that great. That was based off of it. So you guys remember the movie Lucha Libre? Is, it, is yeah, that yeah. what the name was? Or uh -huh. no, no, no. Nacho not, Libre. Nacho, Nacho yeah, Libre. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Lucha Libre is the name of the actual sport. That You know that's based off of a true story? Yeah. Did, did you do that? Yeah, I don't know the whole story, but Dude, I knew I knew like, it was I, loosely. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, it's loosely, very loosely. Yeah, it's loosely based off of a character, right? Which I is, so is I'm going to read this. Aren't to you. most even like uh, fictional movies normally drawn from some sort of yeah, they get inspiration from a real like yeah, character in real mo life. Most times that I've like looked up like a movie like to see if it's true or not, uh, I'll, even the ones that are fictional will normally say like, but then the the author pulled from. Yeah. You know, or they'll use archetypes from other cultures and you know, and they'll bring it in. And well, mm -hmm. check this out. So it's I, relatable. Otherwise, I, it's not relatable. I just saw this and I looked it up. This is crazy. So Frey, his name is Frey Tormenta. He was born Sergio Gutierrez ben, ben, Benitez. He was a Mexican Catholic priest who turned to professional wrestling to support his orphanage. He had an orphanage that needed money. They weren't <laughs> able to get enough money. He wanted to support these poor kids. Was it successful? Yes. Oh, that's, yeah, that's cool. Awesome. He became a wrestler and made money, and he was a famous wrestler as a result. Here's a picture of him after when he was old, and look at that. Uh, he actually went and wrestled no pro way. wrestling in Mexico to feed these kids. What a badass. Now, do you feel that's like- cause How I, awesome I, is that? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if I've cool. sat and watched that whole movie all the way through or not. Uh, yeah, is it a bit I of a mockery him. of him, or do you think it's like- It's all it's paying homage to him. Uh, no, nah, it was all comedy. Yeah. No, it's- it. it because that sounds like a cool story. I think they, yeah. they saw the success of uh, Napoleon Dynamite, and it yeah. was like that offbeat like humor where it was like it, it's kind of slow and dorky. And, uh, yeah. yeah so it wasn't it, that great. It fit within that sort of genre. But, yeah, it was definitely comedy first. Uh, but that's I'm sure they saw that story and were like, hey, like we can make I just I just love that story. Like you have a guy who's like, we got to keep, you know, how do we feed these kids without mm -hmm. parents? And, you know, we can't get no, the no nations aren't working. So I'm going to go do this dangerous, like, pro wrestling is not, that's a dangerous sport. Oh, you just yeah. get, your back is destroyed. Like, you, Dude. I mean, you, there's no way you're making out of, for years in without like major injuries. No, and so he wore the mask so people didn't know who he was. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Are you guys, are you guys peering in? Cool. Are you paying attention to Logan Paul and his whole journey in the, in the WWE? No, so that no. I've, I've just seen Bro, some highlight clips and it's just like, it's very pretty athletic, impressive to see. It's very impressive. From where he started, like kind of just, uh, doing the, whatever, where you talk trash and he kind of does these like reels and then he's doing a few moves, but not nothing crazy. Now he's like jumping off of like Bro. the high spots on these dude love him or flying. hate him he was made for that yeah like the fact that he, he started his like career as this fit. like youtube kid who's like w could be a character and do all sort of that that right away fits into that yeah. he's stayed active and fit for most of his life right and he is like unbelievably talented inside the ring like yeah. I mean, it's They're great. Both, him and his brother are both athletic as hell. Very athletic. Yeah. Super yes. athletic. Yes. And if you see some of the stuff that he's doing, I mean, no. he's like shooting off the ropes, backflipping onto yeah. like onto the concrete and stuff like that, yeah. landing on guys. It's wild. Smashing dude. tables, like jumping all the way out. You know how they do those huge yeah. like backflips? Yeah. yeah. I saw one recently he did, and I was like, wow, that I, was so crazy. When I was looking, reading up on, on this priest, I saw some videos on like pro wrestling moves and stuff. And there's one move where they. I don't know what's called pile driver or whatever, where the guy's upside down and you pretend to hit your, his head on the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the idea is, I land on my knees and I don't let him hit you his use head. Use your thighs yeah, to keep. Him so you don't break his neck. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you, you know, you're doing this. You know, yeah. every week you're doing it in front of lots of people. You're yeah. hot, sweaty, and sometimes the people hit their head and this is get herniated discs. And oh just yeah. Oh, I yeah. mean, 
That sucks. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a rough sport. Yeah, the, yeah. The, I t- I think I've told it before on the podcast. I forget the name of uh, Bret Hart's biography. Oh yeah, I've talked it was about called. it. Um, it's huge though. It's like like a Bible sized book. His family they're responsible for. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. So it's a really interesting read to like all the back backstory and all that stuff like that. I told you guys when I met the Iron Sheik. I think that was his name. Was it the Iron Sheik? Mm-hmm. He was a, a pro wrestler. I met him at uh, it was a bodybuilding convention. And he was signing autographs, and he was, I mean, in a, with a walker. He used like, to swing those uh, those Persian meals. Yes. I loved watching that. Yeah, I was always, like, fascinated by, like, some of those things and, like, the Gada and stuff, like, uh, Indian culture and stuff like that they used to have. Did you know about that way before it became a thing here? Yeah. How did you learn about that? Because that was kind of like how you got into like the old classic bodybuilding stuff, and oh. then went you know further back and saw what the origin of that. I just kind of yeah. traced back a lot of um, from dumbbells to kettlebells to who did what, and then like strength feats and, and all that kind of thing, and then looked at other cultures like what what kind of weights do they use, you know? And then you start seeing that like some of these cultures they're like swinging their weights and they're you know or they're they're doing a lot of like crazy wrestling um feats of strength yes and, and so there's some cultures that are just like all in on the i want to say it's india right with the huge yes they have a, a, a incredible wrestling mm-hmm. uh, pedigree pedigree yeah and that's where this strength training came from right with mm-hmm. the big uh, the massive clubs though like like huge bro like as big as me almost and they're really yeah dude yeah, and, and it's stand- like they're also training for war at the same time yes. and so a lot of the weapons used like a mace yeah and, it's and, like a weapon yeah and pacific uh uh islander and like they had a lot of really cool clubs that they used to <laughs> well, so is that, is that the true origin of like things like mace was it first like yes. training for a weapon yes. before yeah. it was like oh this is a fitness yeah because you're sw- you're literally swinging yes. a, a big metal you know yeah. a heavy object mm-hmm. at the end of a pole right so you train with heavier ones yeah because you would knock and people it just off became horses. a discipline that they would do consistently before they would go off to battle it's just yeah. to, to prepare them you know, physically. Yeah. Doug, can you look up uh, the great gamma? I think his name is maybe G A M A put great gamma wrestler. And then it'll come up. I want you guys to check this guy. He's an Indian wrestler. He was undefeated for, I don't know how long, but there's a picture of him and he just looks, you definitely don't want to wrestle this guy. If you look at this picture of him, did you find it? I did. Yeah. Check this guy out right here. And now, what's his story? When was he wrestling? Yeah. This, look at this guy. Oh, there he is holding that mace. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I mean, and this is like before, you know, they were lifting weight. It's definitely before supplements or steroids. But look at that horse. Yeah, he's a beast. Yeah, look at the size of his. So he was eight, he, he was uh, 18 or was it 1879, 1878? Yeah, 1878. What was his record? I want to look at his record. I love learning about these, uh, like these, these athletes from back in the day with these crazy, you know, records. Mm-hmm. What is it? Oh, 5,000 matches. Mm-hmm. One. 5,000. Oh, see, Bruce Lee was a follower of his. That's how I knew about him. Oh, uh, yeah. Pretty cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. I think that's our our, uh, our cross-sectional <laughs> meeting point is like Bruce Lee because yeah. uh, he, he brought all that together, dude. Do you know that he... Yeah. How do you even win 5,000 matches? Do the math on that. They're just always fighting. Just always... The matches are happening all the time. Like a yeah. crazy amount. Think and, about that. And the so way, many. And yeah, the way that they... crazy amount. There's still wrestling schools that are like this old school uh, style in India where the ground is, um, I want to say dirt or sand. Mm-hmm. And that's what they wrestle in. Mm-hmm. And it's brutal as hell. And they drink... Uh, I think it's like a milk-based diet or something like that to get to get them big. I remember reading about this when I was younger. But hey, you mentioned Bruce Lee... It's funny, my dad was, uh, you know, we were talking today and he brought up Bruce Lee because that was his hero when he was a kid. And he said that's what made him think about lifting weights when he was a kid. And it was when Bruce Lee does his famous lat spread. Uh, Remember when he does this? Yeah, yeah. dude. That was like the first famous lat spread, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I love the, like, when he just prepared to fight like Chuck Norris or something. And then he'd just be like, (laughs) and then he'd just. You see, it's just shredded abs. Yeah, I just saw something with like a Chuck Norris. I think they CGI'd him too. Was there was a there's a new it was a commercial? I think with is him. that what it was a commercial? Yeah. I just as I say, I just saw something with Chuck Norris in it, and do you, was it CGI because he looked yeah. way younger than what he was? Right? I think I've seen the same commercial. Okay, it was that. a commercial. I wasn't sure if it was a commercial or a new movie that was coming out. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, wait a second. Chuck Norris can't look that. Like he looks way older. He's old, but like I mean, yeah, he's 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 able bodied and fit. But like, yeah, he's definitely aged. Did did you ever see his ad? So I used to subscribe. Total Gym. 
No. Oh. So I subscribe to all the bodybuilding magazines, but I never—I don't think I ever really talked about this. I also subscribed to like a bunch of martial arts magazines as a kid, Black Belt and mm -hmm. all those. And in the back of the martial arts magazines in the 90s, there were always like these obscure ads. Half of them were for martial arts that we discovered thousands of year old that can kill you or whatever. And I would buy those books and it was all bullshit. But there was uh, Bruce Lee, uh, no, excuse me, Chuck Norris used to sell, I think they were called action pants. <laughs> yeah, and they were, yeah, have you seen those? They're is jeans. That, they're jeans, they're jeans that are stretchy. Yeah. Is, that, is that where Juji Mufu got his idea? Or yes, what? probably. Dude, it's gotta be, bro. Or is it, yeah, it has him like doing these jump kicks. You saw those too? Yeah. And, and then he has some <laughs> where, he, where they're like cut off jeans and he's in boots. Yeah. You know? yeah. I wonder if Juji got his from that. I wonder if that's where that came of from. Of course. Because you don't want to be stuck. You don't want to be caught Action in a street pants. fight wearing tight ass jeans. You can't even throw your roundhouse, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be able to. The first but image that I comes got my out, action pants. Yeah, I can't help but think of the Napoleon Dynamite clip. You know what I'm saying? The guy in the in the MC Hammer pants, the yes. American flag. Oh uh, yeah. Did you guys ever? I went through a phase of wearing those. Uh, the big the balloon yeah. pants. The second I did. from like fourth. I want to say from fourth to sixth grade around. The I Zubaz. never did. They're, yes. they're called Zubaz. Yes. I had a. You so they, they were like bone fish. You know, like that, yes. that was the pattern. Yes. That was uh, mine. I, mine yeah. did this too. They unvelcroed like oh. this. So they, you opened them like this and then, they, you know, made them open like this big and oh. then you, you velcroed them closed. Oh, Dude, I was a huge MC Hammer fan. Yeah. So I was just, I was all in. Hey, with the tucked friend. in turtleneck. Yeah. <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah, swear bro. to God, bro. You did the tucked in turtleneck. Swear to God, dude. Man, you went all MC in. MC Hammer pants with tucked in turtleneck, dude. Bro, I'm you pretty were in sure, style. Pretty sure I got Did you have right? like the layered, like. Yeah, dog. Did all that. Oh, there they are. You can still buy them. Wow. Do you know who else wore a lot of those that pants? Is, huh? I kind of want to you know, do that. You know who else used to wear those pants for a long, uh, all the time? Who? Bodybuilders of the 90s and 80s. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was bodybuilder pants. Bodybuilders and chefs. You know? it's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's the commonality. What's going on here? <laughs> I don't know. In, in martial arts masters. Yeah. Yeah. Like that like the three. I, I definitely have seen. I remember Remember when I was wearing the, the sweaters again, bringing the, the all cut out open and stuff like that? Yeah. I was wearing that again. Oh, like, the open collar? I've seen that now in the gyms like crazy now. I've seen quite a few people that, uh, that are rocking that. You stuff know what shirt will never about. make it back in style? I, the, my, I know, opinion. the fishnet ones. The half shirt. Yeah. Why were dudes wearing half shirts? Why? Football. Oh, oh, that's a football trend. To cover your pads. Yeah, I, your wish pads. I, I, I wish oh. I said I didn't do that. No, that's totally a football. Did. That's a total football trend. And that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Do you know when I first saw it was Rocky Three, when it, when Rocky and uh, and Apollo and were running, like running on the, running on the yeah. beach. And they had their little tiny half shirts. <laughs> They're like mid Dude, better. now I have to claim that's probably like the, my douchiest look. What? Yeah, but you play football. Yeah, but like I also like walked around campus no, like, yeah. after I was done. You blow. To yeah, just make because I had, I had, you I had get a, a pass. Six pack. You get a pass. In the late 90s? Yeah. You had a six pack, huh? I, for sure. I had a six pack for kind a long of. time. You're just walking around. You, you, paint, you, attention. You, <laughs> you guys are haters, <laughs> but I, I got picks, dude. I, I, I didn't got, care. I, proof. I, I didn't even proof, care. Bro. Well, hold on. See the proof. What a liar right now. Hold on. I wore a half shirt. I had a six pack. I didn't care, though. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like it's douchey, and, and I, I did. I, I got, I got, I got complimented. You know what? Supermodel girlfriend in Canada. Too, yeah, yeah I know, bro. Hey, <laughs> hey you Owen know, Owen Mills picked to prove yeah, it, yeah. dude. I, I almost believed you didn't care until we got that selfie accidentally sent to us for me. <laughs> okay, I know you care because uh, I, still, throws, I still got that saying. I'm listen, using that. not to talk about that anymore. It's, I put that away somewhere. Oh, I'm gonna pull God. that out. That's blackmail, dude. That, Maybe one of the best things that's happened to our, us together. I think that, that was accidental one of my of, favorite. And it, it being Justin is the best. Because if it was one of us, it wouldn't have been that funny. No, because it'll be it'll be a, yeah. it'll be a Friday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, you can't. Yeah, get, I have okay, tendencies, guys. You right? can't. Uh, at least in my opinion, you can't. Uh, you can't hold that against you because it. It regardless of you wearing it at school, it's not. It, but it was functional. So it was. It's a yeah, pass. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah, play yeah. football. Yeah. yeah, you play football. Yeah. Way, if way too serious. If I wore it, you know what I'm saying. Like as a basketball player, or something yeah. like that. Like, well, that's true. Yeah, you know, no functional reason. Because we did stuff like this all the time too, right? Like uh, what people would think was, I think people today would say this is douchey. I don't think so back then. We used to wear uh, socks with our slides all the time. Oh, but that was functional. I had my basketball it's bag convenient. with my with yeah. my sneakers, yeah. and so that. as soon as I get in the gym, all I do is yeah. kick my slides off. Sneakers go either, on. I'm ready to play. Either a basketball player yeah. or a cholo. Those are the two. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, yeah, acceptable people <laughs> yeah. that can wear <laughs> socks. You're not gonna talk trash to a cholo. Yeah. No, yeah. no, yeah. they're cool. No, do your yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get, bro, you're good. Yeah, I, I feel like you get a pass with like some of that stuff. You know, like that if you're if you actually used it, and you were an athlete. So I, is I it okay to wear socks not with slide not with the slides but with the the flip flops of the toes? Toe goes, you know, and it goes in between. Oh you know no, about? that is not oh. cool. That is not cool. I saw <laughs> a guy. Be so the, gross. I saw a guy in the store the other day doing that. I'm like, really? Bro, yeah. It's like 
maybe if you were where, like I could see if you were at home, right? And, you your socks and, off. and the wife goes, hey, could you take the trash out? I've yeah. asked you three times. Real quick. And, you, and, you, get, and you got your flip flops right there and you're just like, you shove yeah, them in yeah. and you go. But you go out in public in that. I just don't like the feeling. I wouldn't like the feeling of my socks in between my. No, clothes. it's awful. Yeah, what are you doing? It's an yeah, awful feeling and a look. What no. a weird, not move. acceptable. No, no, yeah, not take, not acceptable. Take it off. I mean, I it, you know it's tripping me out though. Like so, Ethan, he has like the same size feet as me now. Really? I'm like, it, but he's yeah, he's not. Well, that's because he's gonna get taller. He's what grade, gonna, is, what grade is he in right now? Yeah, so he's going into freshman year. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, Isn't that when you probably peaked your uh, shoe size? No, I don't know. It's hard to say. I don't know. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's about when I I peaked shoe size. Yeah, was I don't remember. No, freshman, I didn't remember it happening. Like, yeah, you got a size early. twelve, right? Yeah, you were a twelve as a freshman, weren't you? Short. Yeah, but my feet were big. I hadn't Holy grown shit. into my feet yet. So yeah. you look like a uh, you look like a diver. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely know I had because uh, you were how tall were you and, as a friend? Because you, you five three. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You were five three with a size twelve shoe. Yeah, probably or eleven, probably at that time, p close to my peak. Oh my god, wow. that's normal. That's a weird. It's normal. You have big feet and then you grow into it as a kid. So yeah, the other way around. Big... You're not hella tall and then your feet grow later. That's even worse, bro. You look like you're a... fucking six three with size oh, five, a... <laughs> size five shoes, and you're six three. Sooner or later, my feet are gonna, gonna grow into this height. Yeah, you look <laughs> little like tiny a... pegs. You look like a Japanese geisha. <laughs> it's way, it's, <laughs> that's way more weird than having big ass feet. There's a time that yeah. every kid but that's goes a through. Huge disparity. Holy. Well, I mean, like I said, maybe I'm off a little you bit, gotta but, be off, I, but I know weird. I remember in, uh, you know, as I remember too, a phase in junior high when you used to wear shoes, you wanted bigger feet. And so you wore bigger shoes. Than oh, what you really? yeah. yeah. I wore like yeah, a size yeah, up. Like a gap like that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember wearing like a size up when I probably shouldn't. So I remember doing that in like fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And then I remember heading into high school, I'm like pretty sure I was close to size 12, close, maybe 11. 11, I probably went yeah. 11, 11 and a half, 12 was probably, and then yeah. I, and then I peaked there and that's always the, the end of it. But interesting. Yeah. I, you, I got to think, you know, but your, your shoe, your they shoe do. size goes first, your feet get big first, and then you mm -hmm. grow into it. That's right. And so no, I think it's pretty normal for a kid going into high school to be close to his. At what age is a typical male stop 25 taller? Oh, no, well, typical. Well, men in general stop 25 things to cut off. Yeah. It's it's like, like, yeah. What would you say? I think it's like, it's like 18. 18. Yeah. I think height is right when I see on average. Kind of. Level out because you were a late bloomer. Yeah, I kept growing height wise out of high school. That's after right. 18. Yeah, I stopped right. when I was eighteen. I was six. I was uh, ever, fifteen or sixteen. Did That's you it. hear me tell you guys that stat? Look up Dennis Rodman uh, growth spurt. How old he was? Yeah, you, you, you it was did. like he was like, like way later. later. Yes, he grew like a foot. Like at like when he was like nineteen twenty or something. Like you know that. what sucks about that? Wow. There's a lot of dudes that just they just hope that that's you know what I mean. They're all oh, uh, Dennis Rodman did it. You know, maybe I'll just have a growth <laughs> spurt. You know. Yeah. It's not, not it's not common. Yeah, no, you're just hanging from the pull up bar like, ah, oh, dude, it's gonna happen. Yeah, no, I I got tall real fast and that was it. I just froze. Early or was it Early. later on? Early. Look at this. He went from five eleven to six seven. Wow. Holy yeah. wow. Isn't that wild? Yeah. That's dude. gotta feel weird. Yeah. So look, it was when he was a janitor at Dallas Fort Worth International Airport. It didn't say how old he was though, right there, huh? No, that's got to be a weird feeling. But it was after high school, so he's mm -hmm. after high school. He hits this nineteen years old. That's mm -hmm. that's a isn't that wild? Crazy that's leap. almost a foot, bro. Yeah, to put almost a foot on after yeah. high school. Yeah, that's that, wild. Uh -huh. This is, and you know, it's, it's it's babies grow like this too. They did that one famous study where where there was a woman that was she was measuring children and babies every, every day. single day. Yeah, because parents always talk about growth spurts, and the common belief was that they grow consistently and parents are like that's not what happens like my kid all of a sudden overnight this is exactly what happens they yeah. grow overnight yeah it's yeah, like so they do nothing and which they explode it totally confirms yeah. what every parent has felt before totally when you don't see your kids for a couple days sometimes and it's like there you like, have those moments like he got taller Bro, i can i can tell i swear i i didn't see my 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 cousin and his daughters for pff, a couple months and then he shows up with his daughters. I'm like, this is, they look way different. It was like a two month period. They look way different, but they're around that age when that starts to happen. Anyway, you know, I was having a thought today uh, that I think needs to be communicated more often to the non-fitness fanatic or person who's looking to get started in fitness and trying to look for a gym. Hmm. Um, and that is that I, I understand that the the hardcore environment in hardcore gyms is intimidating, but that's probably the ble best place you could go because when you're in a gym where you know I'm working out this morning, I'm watch, I'm looking around, and I've worked out at the country club type gym, I worked out at whatever gym, and then I go to the you know UFC gym and it's more serious, and I'm looking around. And I had this thought this morning. I was looking around. And I said, 
Let me ask you guys, how often is it you go to a commercial gym and you look around and 90 plus percent of everybody in there is doing everything right? Never. No. That so and that's what you get in a hardcore gym. And they don't gym. know the social cues and and yes. yeah, the gym culture at all. Yes, it, it, when you go to a serious gym, although it's intimidating because you're a beginner. Yeah, first visually off, the, it's intimidating, that's why. Yes. Yeah. First off, it's the most inviting. Even though it feels uh, intimidating, they're the most likely to help you. People who are very serious about fitness, when you come in as a beginner, you could tap on anyone's shoulder, or even if they see you struggling, they'll want to help you. So you'll get great. You'll, you're more likely to get good advice, but you're also just around proper technique, form, and training. I mean, I was literally this morning. I'm working out, looking around, and typically I'm in my own world when I'm working out. I'm just doing my thing, and if I see someone that I recognize, I'll say hi, and that's it. But I was literally sitting there for a second in between sets. And I was looking at one corner where the, you know, all the, the platforms are. Then I looked at where the dumbbells are. I looked at the machines. And I'm like, you know, first off, my first thought was, boy, has fitness culture changed in 20 years. Like, I saw just as many, and I see this every morning, just as many, many women strength training as men. Everybody in there was strength training properly. Everybody's technique and form was good. I didn't see... I, I, you know, I didn't see shitty technique. I saw everybody pretty much full range of motion, controlled. Uh, they were spotting each other properly. I was like, wow, this is, you know, we should communicate this more often because the average person, they want to go into a gym that feels, uh, they don't want to feel intimidated. Going to a hardcore gym feels intimidating, but that's where you're going to get the best uh, environment, the best learning because you're learning from people who know what they're doing. Problem I mean, with that is that people that are gym shopping, that's not even a factor for them. They don't know that. I know. They don't even know that. that should it's be not a even a thing. It's like, uh, I mean, they've done they've done plenty of, of research on this, right? The three the three C's we used to call it, right? The yeah, convenience, cleanliness, 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 and cost. And cost. So those are the three things that people really care and think about when they make a decision. Now, they should consider what you're saying, right? Especially if you're somebody who is intimidated, you aren't sure what to do, and you want a a, a conducive environment to growth and consistency and yeah. help. And yeah. so in that case, it, it, it would behoove you to find a gym that is more grungy dungeon like type of vibes and people are like look serious, serious yeah there. serious lifters but it, it's so funny because that feel that seems so counter totally right? it's like you would never tell someone else starting at like a sport mm. or something like that like go where all the pros are that's where you should learn how to do this you yeah, know what i'm saying right. you would want to go where the beginners are you think but in this situation, it's actually more advantageous for you to find that because of they're going to be more guys, helpful, better advice. We've been in gyms most of our lives, okay? Think of now, picture a hardcore gym where everybody in there knows what they're doing. They've been training a while. They're very consistent. Now imagine a beginner walking in and trying to use something, not figuring it out. You know what's going to happen. You know somebody's going to go up to them and say, hey, do, yeah. you, do you need help? Yep. Do I'm going to show you how to use this? Are you new here? Let me help you out. Or if they ask a question, absolutely. Like I learned that as a kid. I learned that as a 15-year-old kid. There was a group of powerlifters, scary looking at the time, powerlifters working out. And they were so happy to see some kid working so hard. They asked me what I was doing. I asked them a couple questions and they said, why don't you work in with us? And I learned how to squat. I learned how to squat properly from those guys. So, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's intimidating because people, when they're serious, and, it, and, they're, and they're really into the workout, it looks scary to the outside person. Yeah. But that's the most inclusive, uh, accepting, helpful place you could possibly be yeah. is in that kind of a gym, Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah and, and I mean, they probably feel like they don't want to get in their way and they don't know anything. And like, you know, they're... They feel like they'll, they're going to be annoying or whatever yeah. coming in is not knowing anything. But like, yeah, again, to that point, that that's actually that excites uh, those type of members in there because it's like they see that you you really want to make this happen you're committed to this and so they're willing to get out of their way to come over and kind of give you advice and help you out i can look okay i take my workouts very seriously i have a limited time to work out i have to, to work out really early so i can make it here to work so it's not like i can spend you know extra time at the gym and i can tell you right now the three times that i stopped and took 15 minutes to talk to someone, help someone over the last uh, 60 days. Two of them were kids. So two of them were two times where they, they were under the age of 16. And it's because they were, I saw them looking at me and I saw them doing an exercise and I walked over to them. I said, Hey, what are you doing? You, you, is, you know, how's it going? I start helping them. And then the other one was this woman who uh, she was working so hard. 
um, and it looked like she was getting back into it and she was, you know, look, her goal was to lose weight. And I just had to go over to her, tell her like, man, you're doing a good job. Like you're doing good form. I see you working out. And we talked for like 15 minutes. Were you and your wife beat her? No, not at that's no, this point of the workout. Why? No, I was just I figured that the sixteen year old boys were probably making fun of you. That's probably what no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they're in style now. Like who's that wannabe Rocky guy over there? Hey, first of all, they don't know who Rocky I'm the boss, is. I'm the boss, I'm the boss. <laughs> no, no. Guy, are we getting that age where you can't even reference a movie like that because it's too out of date? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a I have a cousin, young cousin that's uh, just got into car sales, and I reference Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and Boiler don't Room. Don't tell me he didn't know. Either he one. didn't know either one of those. Oh, he's. And I want fire. Oh God, is it bit, like <laughs> so? Obviously, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross is a really old one that a lot of people I know that are. Those you, are sales, but staples. Boiler Room. How old is Boiler Room? Is it getting that old? Twenty something years, bro. Really? Twenty five years, maybe. That makes sense because he's only twenty four. I think is how old oh. he is. So is it is Boiler Room really that it's old? Twenty five so, years at least, bro. Really? Yeah, I watched it. I took my sales guys to watch it when I was nineteen or twenty. So it's got to be. 20 or 25 I mean, years. I remember watching it in the gym. And so I'm assuming it was when I was 20. So I guess 20 years old. No, 25 at least. 20. Let's That's see. my guess. What's the, what's the over under here? 2000. Boom. 24 wow. years old. Wow. Yeah. That's exactly why he doesn't know. Yeah. That's so crazy. You know, for people who've mm -hmm. never seen either one. Dylan's back where they're going like, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about either. Yeah, he's there watching, dude. <laughs> he's over there Googling as fast yeah. as he can right now. <laughs> hey, for people who haven't, like... The, the you have to watch Boiler the, Room. The, the, the language is colorful. It's not like the most... Uh, is it politically know. incorrect in there? Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross is. Big oh. time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They say things in there you can't say anymore on TV. Oh, on, really? On okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. It's. I mean, if you're in sales, you have but to But forget watch the it. language. It's like the... If you're in sales... If you're in sales... That's another one, right? Yeah. So I, those would be my top three. If you're yeah. a salesperson, those are top three movies right there. you yeah. got to watch Glenn Gary. you got to watch uh, Boiler Room. And you got to watch Wolf on Wall Street. I had to say those are like the three best... Those are some bangers for sure. Who are your sales... Did you ever watch or listen to sales, like people who are, you know, like um, sales trainers or... You know, you ever like listen to like Hopkins, Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar. I read Zig Ziglar. I read Tom the, Yeah, I read those books. Um, but you know what? I was, uh, I, and I feel like we all were kind of like this. I was so blessed to be surrounded by really talented, real totally. people. Mm -hmm. Totally. So um, that was, <clears throat> I, I spent a lot of time outside of my work hours inside the gym. Like I would, if I, if one of those sales guys uh, in that I worked with at the time, and I've worked with some of the guys that are great that have gone on to do a lot of different things in sales and been very successful. If they were still in the gym and it's like eight, nine o'clock at night, and I'm done. Like I would come sit over at their desk and mm -hmm. we would talk, and I'd ask them about sales stuff, and I we'd role play, and I would just I would eat that up. So I I spent so much time with people like that. I, I mean, I can't stress this enough for our coaches and trainers too that listen uh, to us and that we're helping through the coaching program, like. You know, when you have that opportunity, I think that's why I get frustrated sometimes too when people tell me they're like, "Oh, it's so hard," or this, that, and they have, they have this opportunity to be learning and to be role playing and to be practicing. It's like you can't expect to be so good at this if you haven't put any of the time in to learn it and get good at it. chase mastery first. Like I saw Hermosi did a really good uh, uh, post the other day. I'll look it up because I'm probably gonna butcher it right now. He talks about the the first two years of like you know building your business or learning is is your time to learn, not earn. Mm -hmm. And everybody approaches it yeah. trying to earn. Yeah, and it's like that's, you're, that's why they quit after six. That's months. That's right, and that's why you quit because you're so focused on the earning part when that's not what you're supposed to be doing doing right now. You're two years into a new craft. You learn right now. Yep. Everything that you do it needs to be looked at through that lens. Now, if you're lucky. You get to earn a little bit along the way if you're lucky, but it doesn't matter even if you don't because really the goal at that point in your career, no matter what it is you're doing, is to learn mm -hmm. and to approach it that way. You're not going to just jump right into being this you know, great salesperson or top podcast or it doesn't like you have to first go through the process of I learning. I think everybody, everybody yeah. benefits from learning sales skills. 100%. It's communications. 100%. Yeah. And it's human behavior. And when you first learn, it's following a script and this is what you say when they say that and this is what you do and that's fine. But when you really get good at it, you just get really good at, at, at being able to communicate. It's the art of communication. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that, I think too, uh, and I think you've said it really well for a long time. I think that if people were to look at it that way instead of this, ugh, 
the sales. The reason why that's got a bad connotation is because we've all experienced a bad salesperson. Yeah, we all we all connected, a bad sales. We all connected to a used car sales. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. not good sales. No, if you leave with a bad feeling and oh, that person was slimy, yeah. he did a bad job. Right. Uh, I, you know, I have a shout out since we're just finishing up with talking about business stuff. Um, I, I mean, I really enjoyed. Uh, the content that Alex Hermosi has put out. And if you are a business operator, you're in sales, you're a trainer, and you don't already follow all of his content, I mean, he, he guy is just a fire hose of uh, business knowledge and information uh, on both his YouTube channel, his podcast, his Instagram reels. Like the guy is constantly putting out fire. So uh, make sure you give him a follow if you're not already following him. LMNT is an electrolyte powder, no artificial sweeteners, uh, no sugar, but it's got the right amount of sodium to fuel your body for workouts, for performance. If your sodium is too low, in particular, you can get headaches, you can get poor performance. This is actually more common than you think with people who eat a whole food diet, and especially if you have a low-carb diet. Anyway, go check them out. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get a free sample pack with any drink mix purchase. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Jamie from Illinois. Hi, Jamie. Hey, how guys. How are you? Good. What's going on? I feel like All we right. tried this. Good for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get right to the question. I'm just going to read it so I stay on task. Okay. Um, I've been lifting weights for about a decade, but for consistently for a good five years now. Um, I've seen strength gains and have watched my body recomp happen. Um, my question is, what are some good ways to increase my bench press? I've never done anything competitive, mostly due to lack of confidence, and I'm not quite sure I can um, hit the numbers on the bar that would prevent me from getting laughed at. However, my local gym has a bench press competition every fall, and I'd like to uh, step out of my comfort zone and give it a try. Um, I'm 41 years old, 135 pounds, and right at five foot. I just hit a PR last week of 110 pounds, um, and I'd love to see that number go up. I'd also love some advice on proper form, as I sometimes get some front shoulder pain um, when doing the exercise. Additionally, I just don't feel as connected to my body as I do when I squat or bench press. Thank yeah, you awesome. so much. Good wow, question. Cool. Great question. Real quick, uh, just to want to address your you know your comment about being laughed at. Nobody's ever going to laugh at no, anybody at a yeah, powerlifting competition. Happy. Yeah, no matter how much weight you lift, it's a very supportive community. They'll see you trying. Uh, it's 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 great. It's it's an, an amazing community. To be and a you're part already, of. by the way, at a respectable bench yeah, press. You're doing fine. Nobody's you're laughing. doing fine. Um, okay, so uh, are you what are you following any of our programs? Because the, the best thing I could do is put you on like a legit powerlifting program. The powerlifting protocol and programming um, is different than like bodybuilding style training or muscle development type training. Um, powerlifting protocols are excellent at getting people stronger at the three lifts, bench press being one of them. So are you following any of ours? Um, I just finished anabolic um, and I've done uh, aesthetic. But no, no power lift or any, oh, strong yeah. or anything. I'm, all right, I'm going to send you. Yeah, I'm going to send you mass power lift. Anabolic was a great for for strength. Aesthetic, it's a lot of volume, uh, yeah. but power lift will get your numbers up uh, yeah. for sure. Now, as far as the shoulder pain, front shoulder pain tends to be the bicep tendon uh, where where it inserts over the shoulder. That could be due to a few different things: overuse, technique, probably shoulder stability, probably weakness in the mid upper back. Who knows? But shoulder mobility shoulder movements mobility, yes, and a strong mid upper back uh, makes a big difference. Priming, uh, for this. priming before you bench yeah. will do wonders. So, yeah. are, are, do you have our prime program? I don't. No, I don't. Okay, it's another one that you should look into too. But for okay. just to give you it straight up, what you should do before is like band pull aparts, uh, shoulder dislocates. Uh, hand handcuff with rotation, those type of movements. Wall circles. Yeah, wall circles. Those types of movements uh, before you go into a bench press will help that, and yeah. that's going to make a big difference before you go in. Is yeah. priming. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you like a little hack. Okay, which shoulder is it? By the way, it's my right. If you push on it, does it feel tender in the front? Can Not you? now it doesn't, but last week after I worked it pretty hard, it did. Okay. Here's an easy hack. This isn't going to fix the problem. What Adam said fixes the problem. But what I'm going to tell you is a temporary relief, okay? You do a static stretch of your bicep. Literally, okay. literally, you, you take your hand out, you stretch out your, your, put your arm on the wall or something, stretch your bicep, hold, and make sure it's your bicep that's stretching. 
hold that stretch for like 40 seconds and then try the bench press again and then the pain's typically a lot better uh, because it tends to be bicep tendon inflammation. So no. would increasing my bicep, would going up in weight on my bicep, no. would that help it? No, no not no, no, necessarily. No no no. No. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with your bicep, but be, where the bicep tendon is and runs over the top of the humerus and the way the shoulder functions, the inflammation will hit that, especially if you're not good at retracting and depressing the scapula when you bench press. You know, MAPS yeah. Powerlift has got really good coaching on biomechanics of a powerlift bench press, which yeah, is, yeah. that's what you want to learn. There's a master class in there that Ben Pollock did where he kind of breaks down all the different like cues and very specific things to look out for technique wise while performing that exercise. Because it is a lot more technical of an exercise people than they it's realize. Very technical. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do to tweak and alter that and, and brace and maintain a lot more leg drive, you know, emphasis that you can kind of learn and teach yourself. Uh, to maximize your efforts. Uh, so yeah, really dive into that and kind of practice it, implement it. Um, but yeah, there's like it, the, the shoulder mobility is going to be huge as well, just to get that solid and we, connection. And, and there, there is some of that in there. There's some priming and stuff like yeah. that. So I, literally that program alone is going to probably do wonders for you. Oh, yeah. just, just considering that you haven't ran something that's like organized like that. The fact that it has the coaching in there from Ben Pollock, Literally just follow that. I think that in itself, you're going to see a big difference. And then we can get into like stuff later. Totally. Like I think there's lots of value too in you doing like bands where the, the bench press is assisted. So you get used to holding a weight that you couldn't do on your own, but because yeah. it's assisting it, there's a lot of that's little- That's more advanced. That's yeah. more advanced techniques. Like for now, follow the program. The program alone, I think is going to add at least 10 to 15 pounds to your bench yeah. press alone. Yeah. So does it go over like proper form yep. as yes. far as yes. how far- Yes, it goes over all of that. It does. Yes, it yes, does. Yeah. By the way, awesome. proper grip, di uh, you know, width on a bar, there's a range, and mm -hmm. you'll see some people will bench with slightly closer grip, super like, wide, like super me. Narrow. Some people do a much wider grip. Um, uh, so there is a range, right? And obviously, too close, too wide, obviously not going to be good. But you'll see some people with a more tight grip, or, or, or what they'll call tight or closer. Some people a little wider. And that's perfectly fine. And you'll find kind of a range, even among power lifters, yeah. um, you'll find it's that. It's a feel thing. Yeah, I personally have found what matters the most with that is actually the what allows you to get your shoulders retracted and depressed where that's the most comfortable because that tends to be what happens to a lot of people is one or both shoulders tend to roll forward and then their arms take over the lift instead of their chest moving that's it. That's where the bicep yeah. tendon is. And so, right. yeah, and that's probably what's going on with the bicep right mm -hmm. now. So what is normally going to be best is whatever position helps you get into that retracted and depressed position. And a lot of this stuff is covered with Ben Pollock in the in the program. So this yeah. is, I think, uh, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds with you because we could be like uh, telling you all these random, like follow that program. Yeah, like no, that, that should be in itself uh, very, very valuable. And then circle back from us after you did that that's and we right. can get into in more In fact, Jamie, stuff. really good uh, powerlifting technique will probably add a few pounds, maybe five pounds to your bench, just that alone. Oh. If you haven't already practiced oh, that's it. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Just All one right. little quick yep. add lower back. It just comes up or stay on the bench. Your lower back off yeah. your yeah. hips. Are you want a natural yes. arch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Your yeah. hips come do your hips stay on the bench. So don't let yeah. your butt come off the bench. Cause right. that'll get you disqualified. So right. upper back and butt yeah. on the bench. Natural arch and love yep. it. Now you might see some powerlifters use really crazy, they, exaggerated it's a bit arches. Excessive. Don't worry about that. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about. Doing but that. but you don't want your back flat. That's not good. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. I'm you, really excited. You got right. it. We'll send that over to you. Gonna crush it. I think everybody when they first get started, when they learn to bench press, they need to learn the powerlifting bench press. Yeah. I think that's the way you learn how to bench. I wish, now later on, you I could do I more bodybuilding that. style, whatever. Yeah, but start there and work your way. The least likely to hurt yourself. You're going to have the most control, most stability. Powerlifters have mastered the bench press. Now, of course, I, like I said earlier, there's this, there's extreme, like where you'll see these crazy arches to limit range of motion, whatever. Most people can't even do that if yeah. they tried. But the, just the, the foundational. I agree. That, that, that yes. technique is so fundamental That's in, it. In, in being able to distribute force appropriately and like really anchoring yourself so where it's not going to expose like areas in the joints or ligaments that, you know, are going to take on a lot of unnecessary force. I, I would actually make the argument for any of the core lifts that this is what you should do. Like going through a powerlifting routine for squat, bench, deadlift. Yep. Yep. 
is probably going to serve you way better than following a bodybuilder program yeah. in any of those because yeah. most bodybuilder uh, programming will have shortened range of motion. They're not going to well, put they, a lot of emphasis on tech, the the technique and the mm -hmm. form. Like the like powerlifters have mastered maximizing biomechanics. Yeah. yeah, and maximized biomechanics typically is the safest way to move. And I say typically because there's extremes. Like people are going to look at pictures of of powerlifters with these crazy wide stances and all that stuff. But you, but, but you take the, the squat suits and the bench shirts off of them and then look at their technique, and that's typically what you want to yep. emulate. Our next caller is Christelle from Canada. Christelle, Hello. how are you? How Hi. can we help you? I'm good. How are you guys? Very good. good. Very right. good. What's going on? Um, uh, so before I, start, before I get started, I just want to say thank you so much for your podcast. Honestly, it's been such a blessing. I'm about seven months postpartum with my second child and just kind of like getting back into working out, fitness and everything. And just finding your podcast has helped so much. So thank you. Awesome. awesome. You look amazing, by the way. Seven months, second kid. Great job. Yes. Thank you. I've lost 50 pounds. I didn't need another 10 pounds and then I'll be good. Great. <laughs> Um, so my question, very simple, really. So I've been kind of doing um, like tracking macros and um, I just kind of want to know, like going forward, should I be focusing more on tracking my, ca like just the calories or just doing macros? Um, I am exclusively like breastfeeding right now. And um, so, yeah, I don't know what you guys kind of recommend. Well, well, one, if you track one, it will give you the other one. And then there's another one that if you track, won't give you the other one. So right. in other words, if you just track calories, you might be off with your macros. But if you track your macros, you're going to hit your calories. Right. So from a, just a, uh, in other words, if you hit your proteins, fats, and carbs, the calories are there. If you just track calories, we don't know how many grams of protein that is. We don't know how many grams of carbs that right. is or grams of fat. And that's really important. Yeah. So macros, I would say, uh, track. Unless it's stressing you out. Unless this is causing lots of stress around food and you're not relaxed around it and you start to get, you know, when you try to eat out, oh my God, what's happening type of deal. In which case, I would reduce the type of tracking you're doing to just protein. You could just do that. Um, that's the most important one. Fat and carbs tend to take care of themselves. So I like I like to just focus on that with most clients until I yeah. need to get really. Rarely ever do I need to get so granular that I'm actually manipulating carbohydrates and fat. And the only time I find myself really doing that is if there's something I notice, like maybe a client is for some reason eating all this low fat stuff and they're not getting enough healthy fats. But if I just have you track protein and calories, it'll the carbs the carbs and fat. It, it really doesn't matter so long as you're getting what your body needs on the fat, healthy fat side. So in other words, like just we decide like whatever your weight is. I know you said you wanted like another 10 pounds. So whatever that number is weight wise, hit that in grams of protein every day and like okay. just be be consistent with that. Then you can allow the fat and the carbs to go up and down based off of how you feel. And I, I like that way of tracking because I think it's healthy for you to have some days where you have a little more fat and some days where you have a little bit more carbs based off of your activity and to kind of play with that, but really just pay attention to what our calories are at every single day paired with that amount yeah. of protein. But in in other words, you won't go wrong if you do this. Hit your, uh, hit your protein targets and eat whole natural foods. So if you okay. eat, eat your protein first, so let's say your goal is – 120 grams of protein a day. All right, I'm going to eat 40 grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Eat that first in your meal um, and make sure it's whole natural foods because heavily processed foods really throw off our satiety signals. We just overeat with heavily processed foods. Very difficult. So whole natural foods, hit your protein targets, eat it first, and you're fine. Everything else is set. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And I'm assuming also that will definitely help with like kind of want to get more Muscle. Getting a little more muscle as yes. well, oh, yeah. and more definition, so that oh, yeah. should help as well. It won't. Okay. It won't even just help. This is what's. This is why this the is a recipe. When it. you asked a question about calories or macros, this is why the macros are so important. Because yeah. let's say you decide that, or we decide that, uh, eighteen hundred calories is what your body needs to lean out or whatever, and you hit eighteen hundred calories, but you miss your protein intake all the time like you don't hit like you get you're under, not gonna get as much muscle you're not gonna build you're not gonna be able to build hardly any muscle you might like wow. lose some weight but you're not gonna build any muscle so we need to definitely make sure that we're hitting that that protein target every single day becomes really really important and then paired with a good tra strength training program are you following any maps right now uh no okay what, so what kind of workout are you doing you're seven months postpartum what does your workout look like right now um, so pretty much I do cardio four days a week, just like 30 minutes. I try to keep my heart rate around like 150, 155 average, and then just like strength 
training. I do like legs and like arms and oh, yeah. Oh my nothing. God, Christelle, we're, oh, we're going to yeah. blow your mind. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hold let's, on a second. Yeah. Let's back up for a second. What do you have? Are there any, uh, any things that we need to know about any movement issues, any pelvic floor issues after having your baby, uh, any core stability issues, anything like that before we move forward? Yeah, more like pelvic. I'm still kind of working on that, trying to at least trying to find something. But yeah, muscle mommy. Yeah, pelvic area. yeah. So I'm gonna send you muscle mommy. Follow that program like it's laid out. Take anything out that doesn't feel comfortable, but I think you're gonna be okay. There's some pelvic floor exercises in there that I think you can practice, and then cardio. I mean, I would rather you just track your steps and just be just be moving. I'd rather you focus primarily yes. on strength training. Wait, walk and do muscle mommy. Yeah, unless you like yeah. the endurance and stamina from running or whatever you're doing. Even then, I wouldn't want you to do that yet. Yeah. Because we can get there. You can build okay. endurance and stamina in literally a couple weeks of doing that. Like, yeah. literally, if you want to sculpt and shape the best version of you body wise Just follow the program follow muscle mommy the way it's laid out and by and and there's a uh, places for you to do the pelvic floor size that's what you're going to do in there that alone by hitting your macros or hitting your protein intake like we we're saying it'll take care of the yep. rest yep okay awesome thanks yes. guys yes. you got it we'll send that to you okay i would love to hear back from you too so after you've been going through the program for a while check back in with us Okay, I definitely will. Thank you so much, guys. Again, I really appreciate everything you guys are doing with this podcast. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Yeah, good. Easy. I know, I'm glad I asked her about her workout. Just, yeah. I just want to point out that uh, mm -hmm. I had to fight a little bit for pelvic floor exercises and muscle mommy. Do you, oh, you, it were? <laughs> that was, yeah, Do you okay. remember that? Well, because we have Do starter. That, that I, program yeah, tends to be we, the postpartum. I know. We wrestled with that, and I was just like, I just think that yeah. there's going to be a lot of that, per, just like that, clients yeah. just like that, yeah. that have come out of that, but they still need to focus on the pelvic floor, but they want to build and sculpt yeah, that yeah, that yeah. body. Yeah. yeah. So perfect example yeah, of that right is. there. You are but, the pelvic floor experts. So. Yes, yes, yes. That's what that's what they say. Um, I, <laughs> I, the, the I, I, I do know that, <laughs> that sounds bad. We, yeah. were, we were brief with her as far as like just kind of telling her, yeah. and I just want to – make sure that she sounds like she's only been listening for a while uh, uh -huh. or the short while with us uh do, do skip the 150 beats per minute four days a week cardio completely yeah, and, yeah. And, and, unless that's unless you want a lot of unless yeah, it's endurance and you love it yeah, yeah. You know? no she was you could tell she wants to build build the I body know, right now like that's where she's yeah, at her goals right? are were different than, than by what the she's way doing. one of yes. the worst thing i don't know what kind of cardio she's doing i'm assuming running but uh because of the, what she said with the heart rate but if you have pelvic floor uh, issues, which you typically do postpartum, if you have natural childbirth in particular, it's a recipe for wetting your pants. You're gonna run, running. Yeah, is, running it, you start. Jumping, you create lots of imbalance. You start to strengthen these uh, these pelvic floor issues. Now that doesn't mean you can never run again if you love to run, but you want to strengthen those pelvic floor muscles, the core stability muscles, all the muscles that had to change to accommodate the growth of the baby and then to help uh, with childbirth. But you need to rehab those, to, for lack of a better term. Then you get back to that kind of stuff. But running right afterwards, you have a lot of women with problems. And they oftentimes, years later, like, oh, I never was back to normal. You never rehabbed them properly. Hey, real quick, here's the August special. We got two programs on sale, 50% off. MAPS bands, half off. And MAPS 40 plus, that's also 50% off. If you want either one, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code AUGUST50 for that discount. Back to the show. Our next caller is John from New Jersey. What's up, John? What up, John? How can we help hey, you? How you, guys, how you guys doing? Good. We're doing all right, man. Sure. How are you? Uh, I'm great. I'm, I was just surprised to get the email back. So um, I'm ready to get some answers. I'm ready to get some help. So if it's good with you guys, I'll just go right into the email. Yeah, let's, let's hear it. it. Let's go. All right. So um, love the show. Been a listener for a while now. Um, I've looked at a, other programs. Pat Flynn has a 300 swing a day program, which is 300 swings a day in different variations for 30 days. Dan John has something like the 10,000 swing challenge, which is two two days on, one day off, 500 swings. Does this make sense to kickstart before using something like um, Sal's program, uh, your program in your book, which I have your book, which is great, by the way, um, or a MAPS program, or would you not advise to do that? I'm five foot six, um, I'm 207 pounds strong, but definitely over fat, to use that phrase. Um, I would like to kickstart something after a prolonged mental health struggle. So, um, you know, I've kind of just, I've had a, over a year of kind of just like not doing what I normally do, bouncing from thing to thing, not staying consistent with anything. So I'm kind of just at a bit of a loss 
and looking for some help from you guys. John, this is a cool question because it gives me the opportunity to share something about the, the workings of our business and our marketing team. So our marketing team would absolutely love it if we did something like this because people gravitate towards challenges like these, not because they're effective or they're good, but because they're marketable. And we've refused to do it, even though we probably lose out on a lot of money because of that. And so the simple answer is you're far better off following the resistance training workout that is in Sal's book or something like MAPS Anabolic to start you off if results and a better program is what we're, we're seeking. And that's just, that's just a fact. Yeah. These challenges are great ways to get people started on moving. And so that's the argument for them. But as far as better programming, you're not going to beat like a, a laid out program like maps yeah. now i'm gonna so i'm gonna i'm gonna counter adam a little bit and and not really what he said because what he said is 100 accurate uh but the counter is this there is some value in starting out uh, some kind of a challenge that requires some kind of discipline because it creates a sense of purpose it creates a a, a drive a target some accomplishment so there's some value there i could see that like especially if you felt lost you're floundering and now every day you've got this challenge and then you meet that challenge and that could build confidence. It could get, make you feel like, okay, I'm doing something. I'm feeling better. So I can see the value of that. I just don't think it's 300 swings or 10,000 swings or anything like that. I think it would be good to start with some kind of a challenge, but I would, I would go more the mental spiritual route. And then for your workout, train yourself properly because what you're sacrificing with the 300 or 10,000 swing is your, your, your safety. You're in, you're going to have high injury risk. It's not going to get you in better right. shape, uh, uh, in the way that you should. It's not really good for you. I, again, I can see the mental potential benefits, but there's better ways of doing that. Like maybe you have a 30 day, a 30 day meditation or prayer challenge. Maybe it's a, a, a 30 day challenge of, you know, eating a particular way and, 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 you know, keeping a journal or something like that. I, I like all that, but as far as workouts are concerned, it's far from ideal. It's yeah. absolutely it's 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 almost as far from ideal as you can get. You'd be better off with the maps program starting that. And then if you want that daily, I need some kind of a daily discipline. I would go more the spiritual mental route, not the necessarily. Although the physical challenge stuff I know can cross over into that. I get that. But it, you know, trying to lose weight five six two zero seven. You said you're over fat. Probably not ideal, I would say. Definitely not ideal. It's, I mean, I guess it's somewhat similar to, we get people that are really into running and cardiovascular pursuits and things that like, but meanwhile, they're trying to build muscle and they're like, well, can I, can I just do that as well? And um, this is a skill that's very specific uh, and I love this skill and I, I think that it'll translate well in programming down the road in terms of like mastering a kettlebell swing. Uh, and it does require a lot of practice and it's going to require a lot of those reps. So I don't really have it, like qualms with, you know, a high number of reps to, to get proficient in that very specific type of a skill. But if you look at it as a skill, not necessarily something that's getting you in shape or something that's like getting you overall stronger or like building your body up or moving the needle for your fitness necessarily. And I know that's, maybe like contrary to a lot of the kettlebell heads out there. Uh, but like having more of a well-rounded base and, and a foundational base to build off of strength wise, and then kind of pursuing skills within the fitness realm. I think that's great. I think that these are all like, uh, pieces to the, to the overall puzzle of your journey. Uh, and so I don't think that this is a bad pursuit. I just think that if, you know, where you're at right now is to get like this foundational base, the strength base established first. Uh, and, and we need to just go into the sound programming for that, where that covers uh, the overall. And I got something for you. If you want to do like a 30 day cool challenge. So I'm going to send over maps anabolic to you. Follow uh, that. Start follow it. Starting a preface. And then here's your challenge. Okay. Do it exactly how it's laid out, including the trigger sessions, which leaves you with two days of nothing else. I want you to walk on those two days. So every day you got something. Either you're doing a foundational day, you're doing a trigger day, or you're walking. So every day you're you, doing you do one of those things, right? So if you don't have a foundational day, you don't have a trigger day, then you're walking that day or you're following okay. what it says in there and do that for 30 days. Watch what, Watch how you feel, look after 30 days. Totally. Good idea. No, I appreciate that. You know, I, I was looking that the reason I was looking into things like I had asked, it was because I was looking for something every day because okay, I cool. find myself, you know, struggling mentally when mm -hmm. I'm not doing something every day. I respect that. Um, yeah. 
So I, I, that's, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. Sometimes you just need to hear it like, and, and hear it from you guys, not talking to somebody else, but talking to me, Yeah. Um, you know, that I need to, you know, that I can do something every day, but it doesn't have to be 500 swings every day or 300 right. swings every day or, the, you know, the program of the month. Um, so, uh, you know, I really, I, I appreciate that help. And, um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's a great challenge. I, lo I love this. So, and, and we'll send it over to you. So you got it and, and check back with us after 30 days, how you're feeling. And I get that by the way, like, uh, early on in the podcast, I talked a lot about, uh, when we talked about programming and, I made the case that I liked going to the gym every day because it was a, a part of my routine. And if I make it in a daily thing where I, hey, from this hour to this hour, I'm doing my workout, uh, it, it's better for me consistency wise. But what you have to learn to do is to modify that for what's ideal for you. Like me lifting weights seven days a week for an hour is not ideal. But if I did three days a week of lifting, two days of walking, and you know an, another two days of stretching, like, okay, that's awesome. So learning how to yeah. modify that every day doing something to improve your health. Like I love it. And I think the thir the 30 day challenge with maps and the two days off that you're not taking off that you're going for a walk for that hour is perfect. Okay. All right. We'll definitely right. do that. All, All right. right, John, we'll All send, right, it, John, to we're send it over to you. All right. All right. I appreciate it. You got it. Keep us posted. I will. Thanks. You know, I, I got to say, I got to want to add this again. Like I get it. Like you feel lost. You feel like you don't have a direction no sense of purpose. So then you see a challenge and it's like 30 days of, you know, X, something really hard. And it's mm -hmm. typically something physically hard. And it gives you this sense of direction and purpose and accomplishment, but it's not, it's not the same as real purpose. It's not the same as real direction. Um, and, and but I get it. I get how it can be a kickstart for someone it's to help spark them. more than anything. I get it. I totally get it. Uh, but you got to you got to understand it's a it's a it's a cheap version of real direction, real purpose. Now I'm not saying that doesn't work for some people, but there are more effective ways of doing it, and they tend to revolve around the core things that are happening. That doesn't mean you don't involve some physical element, but when it comes to exercise, if you do it wrong, at at best you don't get good results. At worst, you hurt yourself. And so then what happens? This is what I've seen. People do these challenges, and week two, they injure themselves. Now they're worse off than they were before because now they yeah. can't. They're and then so they're fixated on the challenge yes. and the numbers, That's and right. they're not really paying attention to their body signal. That's well, right. we, we, we actually have plenty of stuff around this as far as research on the psychology of this. This is a reason why uh, birth control pills have a pill every day, yet one of them or two of them are not even I used. Think it's, a, it's like a, a week of yeah. them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. that are, just get are the sugar pills. Yeah, it's just because it would be more difficult to train someone to go every day, but then skip these seven That's days right. in a row. Or And the same thing goes if you were teaching your child to brush his teeth every morning. If you're trying to teach him that... And and you skip two days of the week, they're less likely to be consistent if you just made it an every single day thing. So I get the, I'm trying to be consistent. I need something every day that I have right. a lot of this time. So do that, but then learn to modify it. Just like I just suggested with him is that follow something like a maps. And then, you know, if for other people that are listening that want to try and apply the same philosophy, um, I do this because I am very much so I am like this where I, I need that. I need to have something every day that I'm focused on, but then it, it, one day it, it's reading another day it's mobility and it, so it doesn't have to be all right. those things improve me right all those are going to make me a healthier version of myself so it doesn't always have to be like training or pushing yourself in the gym it could be one day is going for a walk one day is mobility then one day is pushing in the gym one day could be i mean it could be a lot of different things so you know modify a map if you need that modify a maps program because the programming is so is done so well and then you know do other things that improve your health or improve your life on the other days our next caller is Kristen from Montana. Hi, Kristen. Hey, hey, hey. What's going on? Oh, my God. This is very bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Good. How are you doing? Good, right. good. How can we help you? Good. I just wanted to first say thank you for everything that you've done. I feel like I'm a mind pump success story, and I don't think I'd be where I am now without you guys. So a big thank you. Aww. Big thank you to awesome. you guys. You're welcome. Um. So my... My question is about symmetry. So I compete in Olympic lifting and my programming is we don't do anything uni uni unilateral at all. <clears throat> and I have a weakness in my right hamstring, which causes my right leg to track out and back when I snatch, um, which causes me to dump my bar forward a lot. And um, 
we squat in the program, front squat, but we don't do any lunges and we don't do anything unilateral at all. Um, and if I was thinking ahead, my off season is the end of April until right now. I probably could have ran symmetry in there at some point, but now I'm starting my new program. I'm going into my meets at the end of October. Um, so I just don't know if I can like, I think running symmetry with my Olympic lifting program would be too much volume because I'm already toggling that too much volume switch. Um, but I just didn't know going into this meet if I should swap out some of my back squats for maybe back rack lunges or front rack lunges um, or how I should kind of do all of that with getting some unilateral in because I am a lot weaker on, well, my right hamstring's weaker, but my left side is generally weaker than my right side. I wouldn't. Not right now. Yeah. How important is it that you do this competition? Oh, well, that's Can, the other question. Yeah. Oh, this is, no, this is my life. This is not, yeah, okay. I'm okay. doing the competition. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, after you're done, I would Appreciate do symmetry. Leading up to it, when you're doing your squat workouts, uh, I would mm -hmm. swap out some of the volume of the squats for unilateral work, starting with the weaker side. Starting now? And, and letting it dictate. Yeah. Just swap out some of the squat volume. Not the Olympic lifts, not the technique work, but like how often do you do barbell squat work? So I only run, I'm pretty particular about my programming because I I come from like an overtraining past. So I only work out three days a week and that's my maximum. So on Monday, obviously I'm front squatting when I clean, but on Monday I typically back squat. And then on Wednesdays I overhead squat. And then on Fridays I front squat. Okay. On the back squat and on the front, on the back squat and the front squat day, I would swap out a little bit of volume and do unilateral work. And I would start the workout out that way, and I would okay. I would let the weaker side dictate how many reps the stronger side does. So let's say you do five sets of back squats. I would do mm -hmm. two sets of unilateral work, starting with the weaker side and then moving to the stronger side. And be very careful with your technique and form. It's going to feel very awkward at first um, okay. and a bit weird. And then do the rest of your squats. I don't think you're going to lose any strength in your back squats uh, by doing that, uh, especially at this. I mean, yeah. how long have you been training and competing mm -hmm. for? Well, I've, I am from a powerlifting background, but I just switched to Olympic lifting last January. So about a year and a half, but I hold on to my back squat pretty well. Like I haven't squatted in the summertime. I kind of mess around. I ride my horses a lot and, um, I don't train as much. Um, but I just had a really heavy back squat last Monday and it was still there. So I'm, I'm not really too concerned good. about losing That's my strength. Good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Then yeah. I would, then, yeah, what I said would be one way to kind of do it. Although you're in your 12 week cycle moving up, I wouldn't expect tons of changes in progress, but you probably will get a little bit, yeah. a little Just, more stability, it'll yeah. at least uh, you know address that. But yeah, this is kind of patching that in leading into your competition, which is going to take priority. But yeah. you know, when you can, obviously run the full symmetry program. That's going to be ideal. That's yeah. what I would love to see. I'd love to see you that actually for sure. take a a three month break of actually really working on this, and then and then go back to a you know Olympic lifting protocol. I think you'll see huge benefits just from one full cycle of symmetry. Totally. And yeah. then and then and then do you have Maps Prime Pro? Yes. Oh yeah. I'm like a mid, like when I first started Olympic lifting, I couldn't even put my hands over my head and I can sit on my heels in an overhead squat now. Nice. Wow. wow. That's nice. awesome. Yeah, so Prime Pro, you know, there's correctional stuff in there for hips and ankles and yeah. I would, you know, I would practice that stuff cuz that's probably where it's coming from and really create yeah. tension in those, but Aside from that, because we're 12 weeks out, we're a bit limited on on really how much pro progress we can make here. We could just, like Justin said, kind of try to improve some of the stability. Kristen, I know you... Yeah, like... Go ahead. Sorry. Oops. No, go um, ahead. If I'm think like thinking ahead with the way I've always worked out is I, I live in Montana, so our summers are cherished here. So we do... I would next year for sure want to want run at symmetry during my quote unquote off season, um, kind of in the summertime when I'm not really chasing any numbers or doing anything. But, um, here I am at the end of August and <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It's a big change. I mean, it's, it's you're going to feel, it's going to feel weak, you know, because you're so used to bilateral. I remember Ben Pollock, who's a incredible power lifter, I, we were, you know, I remember he started doing lunges, sta yeah. just stationary lunges. And here's a guy who squats 600 pounds for reps. And I think he had like 135 pounds on the bar and it was challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a neuromuscular thing.
for sure. Yeah, I definitely think my I'm really worried about my right hamstring and I feel like that's an injury waiting to happen at some point mm. as my lifts go up. So I definitely want to target that going moving forward from now just so I can catch that hamstring up. Um, smart. Mm -hmm. That's smart. So, yep. yeah, I just I don't want to be injured is really my my and we do so much. I mean, all I do is clean pulls and Olympic lifts and back squats and front squats. Like I don't go sideways at all. So I've been doing like loaded Cossack squats and stuff like that. Oh, good. Because yeah. we're sane in one plane. Yeah. No, no, that's Any good. stability. Yeah. Laterally and in, in with, with rotation is going to aid in that. So you, especially in your mobility and like your sort of active recovery days, you know, to keep that established is like just movement that you're stabilizing, I think is very beneficial. Awesome. Love well, it. thank you guys. I appreciate it. You got yep, it. Thank Thanks you. for calling in. Yep. She's been with us for a long time. Yeah. I, I recognize her name. She's so been do in I. the community for a long time. You know, um, when you're training in a specific cycle for a competition, you know, 12 weeks out or whatever, this is, it's it's hard to really make any um, crazy improvements yeah, that's outside why was, of what you don't I was surprised that you even recommended anything. I Just a little bit for stability. I mean, it's like, yeah. I mean, I, I after you, you, you broke it down and said how you would do it, I, I don't disagree. I just, I, I would have probably been like, listen, if I can't get you to not do the meet and focus on it right now, then I don't want to disrupt your normal prep for getting ready for it. So do your thing. And then after pre or after your show, uh, we will do, or your meet, uh, we'll do uh, a focus on symmetry if I can with her. So, you know, she'd also really benefit from a cycle of old timey. I think old timey, oh, wow. old timey would be a, yeah. so, so that would be a really good one for her, especially hearing her talk about how she's, she doesn't do a lot of things, uh, in the sagittal plane at all or the oh, frontal yeah. plane at all. I think that would be she is strong and yeah. in all kinds of new directions. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would be a super beneficial one for her too. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did check this one out.